Hi, sorry we weren't able to get together this morning in person for HIT 210, but with the roads being slippery, I wanted to be safe rather than sorry. So I decided I would go ahead and do this video on chapter six and seven in our book. Uh, there's a lot of material to cover. Hopefully the po between the PowerPoints, this video, the reading that you'll do, um, and then the workbook exercises, it will be, it'll all work together and come together. But there's a lot of stuff, so let's dive in and take a look at it. If you'll go to page 96 in your book, that's where we start the chapter on Medicare, chapter 6. It starts out by giving you some background information about national health insurance. Medicare is a national health insurance. However, it is a national health insurance that is only for those who are 65 and older. It is not <clears throat> the same thing as what has been proposed as single payer system or health care for all. Um, that would be something different. Um, might be more similar to what you see in the VA situations. But um, this is, we're talking about just Medicare, so it's 65 and older, except for a few exceptions that we'll run across. Medicare is administered by CMS, good old Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. You need to know CMS. That's an abbreviation that is used often in healthcare, so make sure that you have that one uh, memorized. And then it goes into Part A and Part B. Part A is for hospital-based care or hospice-based care. Part B is usually for out, all other types of outpatient care, and Part D is for prescriptions. The next um, I, section that you'll run into is eligibility requirements, and that's where it gets into be more specific. Who's covered, who's not covered? How does disability play into all of that? Flipping to page 68, it talks about Medicare enrollment and goes through, it touches briefly on illegal immigrants, but really immigrant status isn't, isn't it what's really at play here. It's more, are you covered under Medicare or not? And that, and there are Ill illegal immigrants who can be covered under Medicare. So someone's status, legal, illegal, that's really neither here nor there for what we're doing and for what Medicare looks at. Health insurance cards, it talks about what those are. You have a Medicare beneficiary ID. It's different than your social security number. Um, so, the, and it is considered as critical as social security numbers to be kept confidential. So keep that in mind. Someone's Medicare beneficiary um, identifier, their number, is considered to be very confidential. Uh, goes back to those HIPAA rules. Benefits, it talks about Medicare Part A benefits. What are those hospital benefits? What's the benefit period? Um, some different scenarios to go through to understand what that's like. They actually show you an example of a Medicare card on page 99. So if you look in your book, you can see that. That's figure 6.1. They kind of blow it up and they go through all the different um, pieces and parts. And then at the bottom of page 99, we get into part B. What is part B? What is it for? Who does it cover? Does it cover dentistry? Does it cover a doctor of chiropractic services? Does it cover a podiatrist? So that's all in there. And then you flip over to page 100, and that has a table in there. Most of the information you're going to see in this book is going to be from 2018, even though the book was published a little bit after that. This is, they're using information that's a couple of years old because they have to. It'd be impossible to use something for 2020 in 2020 and still have it published. So that's why we have a little bit of a lag. And the government typically is at least a quarter behind, sometimes a year behind, so it makes sense. But there's a, a good table, uh, figure 6.3. Take a look at that in your book. Um, that will tell you some of the services, the benefits, what Medicare pays, what the patient pays. Um, you don't have to memorize that. You just need to be familiar with those categories. Then you talk about Medicare Part C, and that's Medicare Advantage Plan. And you can read about that at the bottom of page 100. Table 6.1 starts on page 101 and it goes through page 103. And that's a really helpful table to skim through a couple of times just so that you're familiar with what's in it. Um, for example, one thing that you may run into if you work in a clinic, a physician, a primary care physician clinic, is screening colonoscopies. 
um, that that's one of those um, HEDIS measures. It's one of those uh, services that they want to provide to people who are 50 and older to try and catch colon cancer early. So understanding um, what's covered, what Medicare pays, what the patient pays for certain things like that um, could be really helpful to you. So just skim that a few times to make yourself familiar with some of the most common things like mammograms and lab tests and those types of things. So um, then we move on to page 104 and that's where we get into Medicare Part D. It talks about the prescription drug benefits that are in there and how that works. Um, they'll mention the coverage gap which is called a donut hole and you'll want to be familiar with that because some patients will, might have questions about that. And then it talks about formularies. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with a, a drug formulary. Uh, most plans have a formulary. It has the the prescription drugs that they cover and what they cover. Um, a good example might be asthma medications. They'll list for you the different inhalers that they cover and um, how much they pay and you may notice that for um, brand name um, inhalers that are not yet available for generic that they'll pay a good portion of those versus once a generic is out um, or other companies start bringing out similar products uh, you may see that they're not as willing to cover those um, quite as much. So they're going to talk about the different drugs. They'll talk about what's excluded, for instance, drugs for cosmetic purposes, um, symptomatic relief for colds and coughs, um, drugs for weight loss or weight gain, um, and then they have um, prescription vitamins or minerals unless they're prenatal. And there's a, a several other things under that class at the bottom of page 104. And you just want to, again, be aware of those. So moving on to page 105, um, it'll talk about Medicare for railroad workers and their families. Now this is a pretty narrow category. It used to be there were a lot of, of individuals who worked for the government through the railroad and and that has changed over the years and most of those individuals really are on Medicare now so you'll need to be aware but it's probably not the most common that you'll run across and then it talks about those who are elderly but employed there's quite a few people um, who are over the age of 65 still working and good for them um, it, as long as they're enjoying it and they're in good health go for it. Anyway, in these cases where they're employed and they have group insurance through their employer, Medicare is what's called an MSP, a Medicare Secondary Payer. So you'll want to make sure you understand about Medicare as a secondary payer whenever there's a commercial plan involved as the primary payer or Medicaid. As we get into Medicaid, you'll notice that um, if a patient has Medicare and Medicaid, Medicaid is the primary payer first, and then Medicare comes in as a secondary payer. So just a couple of things to keep in mind there. And then um, that takes us up to page 106. And on page 106, there is a nice table there talks about coinsurance co -in and co-payments and, and different things like that. It's figure 6.5 and it talks about Medigap plans that were available and different different plans had different coverages. So it just kind of gives you an idea of, of some of the range of what's out there and what's available or what was available in 2017. Um, then of course we talk about Medicare as a secondary payer and how that works. Um, at the bottom of page 107 is um, 6.1, procedure 6.1, and that goes through really nicely and talks about um, whether Medicare is primary or secondary and additional benefits. So I would definitely take a look at that table. Moving on to page 108, uh, it talks about automobile or liability insurance coverage. If you're in an auto accident, um, your automobile insurance is your primary and then of course if you're it covered by Medicare Medicare would be a secondary but it goes through and talks about um, how um, how that works when you're in an automobile accident or someone who has Medicare is um, and how that would work out 
Then we go into utilization and quality control. There are what are called QIOs, quality improvement organizations. Um, those are looking at how to improve the quality of care, making sure that it's done with good practice, best practices, standard of medicine, um, making sure that it's done in the most appropriate setting. Um, not everything has to be an inpatient. A lot of times an observation stay or an outpatient stay or an outpatient procedure makes more sense um, and is more appropriate to the level of care. A good example would be home health care. Um, sometimes a patient could very much utilize that. And then they review for reasonableness, reasonableness, appropriateness, and completeness and adequacy of care given in the different settings. So um, obviously documentation is critical for that. In order to determine is it appropriate, we have to have documentation to know what actually occurred. So that's in there as well. And then of course it gets into compliance issues, billing compliance, and has a section on that. So then on page 109, you're now talking about program fundamentals. You're looking at providers, who's a participating of provider, do they accept assignment, um, is their service an, a, you know, worth an approved charge, those types of things. And then it talks about non-participating providers. Um, you know, how, do that, how does that work and what's a limiting charge? Uh, page 110 gives you a view of a CMS 1500 claim form. Um, we're going to get familiar with those over the next couple of weeks, so go ahead and take a look at that and some of the details of the boxes and whatnot. Page 111, we start talking about prior authorization. What are some of the procedures that require prior authorization and what is prior authorization? Um, how do we get prior authorization? How do we reach out to an insurance carrier and get that pre-approval for what's happening um, and what what that is. Now th that leads into our next conversation which um, I think is, is an important one and that has to do with what are called NCDs and LCDs. NCD is a national coverage determination policy and LCD is a local coverage determination policy. These are made decisions that are made by Medicare, its contractors, um, NCDs can also be used by private insurance companies. You'll often find that they have that in policy form and they choose to use Medicare sometimes, sometimes they choose to use different ones. It just really depends um, on what they're doing. Um, there are certain things that they will cover and certain things they will not cover. And if they will not cover it, the patient needs to be made aware of that prior to the procedure. And they a Medicare patient and they need to sign what's called an ABN advanced beneficiary notice and they start talking about that on page 111 um, explaining about what that is when is it signed who signs it why why does it have to be in place and that continues on to page 112 if you don't have a benefit an ABN signed you can't bill the patient Basically, the facility or the provider has to eat that charge. They have to write it off because you can't do that. You have to inform patients of what's being covered, what's not being covered, what is their responsibility, what isn't. So examples of some non-covered services are on page 112, long-term care, most dental care, eye exams related to prescribing eyeglasses, dentures, cosmetic surgery, and then the list goes on. And then... Um, they have a section on prepayment screens, it talks about correct coding initiative, which I want to say we might have touched on before. And then page one, 113 shows you um, an ABN. What does it look like? What are the sections? Is there a place for a patient to sign? Moving on to page 114, we get into Medicare reimbursement. So there we talk about the Medicare fee schedule, and we get into the RBRVS, which is Resource-Based Relative Value Scale. And um, 
that has been used for a long time. Um, and it goes through explaining what it is and, and the percentages and that sort of thing. Then it goes on to talk about the prospective payment system, how that changed up some things, um, particularly on the inpatient side. But then um, the value-based programs have come into play. And that has um, impacted physician payment, especially the last two to three years. Um, and it will continue and it will increase. So there's some good information. I would definitely read through page 114 and familiarize yourself with that. And then, um, and that and that leads into page 115 where MACRA is discussed. MACRA is the, is the um, healthcare reimbursement system on the provider side that is currently in play. It used to be the, the old Medicare fee schedule, now it's value-based programs, particularly MACRA. And MACRA um, has an advanced payment model, and an, an advanced APM, or you can choose to be covered under what's called Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, MIPS. And um, it goes on, it talks about the four components of MIPS are quality performance, advancing care information, cost, and improvement activities. And so that has to be reported and assessed on an annual basis. APMs are, are a little more, um, I don't know, would you say structured? Yes, structured. I guess that's probably a better way to put it. They also have reporting that they have to do on an annual basis, but because of the way that they are structured and the way that they are required to operate, it's a little bit different than, than MIPS, which is more for individual physicians. So then we go on to page 116 and we talk about claim submission, and that's where we get into the MAX, the Medicare Administrative Contractors or Medicare Contractor. Um, it shows the different ones for the different regions. Iowa is under WPS, um, just to kind of give you an idea. And the MAC, they, they provide a number of services for Medicare, but essentially they're a private insurance carrier that's been contracted by CMS to process their claims, especially Part A and B claims for their fee-for-service beneficiaries. And so there's a whole list of things on page 116 that the MAC is responsible for doing. And every couple of years, each region comes up for bid. And so you'll notice that, for instance, um, there are several regions that are covered by the same one. Um, region JL and Region JH are covered by Novitas. Um, regions JF and JE are covered by Noridian. Um, regions J8 and J5, which is what we're in as J5, are covered by WPS. But anyway, they come up for contract renewal and they can either keep the contract if Medicare reselects them or they can let it go or Medicare can choose someone else. So you have to periodically check and see who is the MAC for your region because it can change. It doesn't always, but just one of those things to kind of keep in mind. Um, MACs also process claims for durable medical equipment suppliers. So um, that's one thing to remember. Then it talks about the National Provider Identifier, an NPI number. It's what every provider has to have. And there's actually one, there's actually a national um, tax ID number and some several others that you have to have, but providers themselves have to have an, a national identifier number. And then it goes on and talks about time limit and instructions for claim sub submissions. And then it talks about what happens after the claim is submitted. On page 117, what's a remittance advice? An RA, notice of payment, explains any adjustments that were made during the Medicare adjudication process. And so it goes through, it details all of that. Um, you'll probably hear the, the, the title or the acronym ERA for electronic remittance advice for electronic billing. Um, so it's gonna go through all of those. Then page 118 
talks about a Medicare summary notice, um, why is a patient mailed one of those every three months and what's on it. Um, there's some information about posting payments and how, how to handle Medicare overpayments. Um, that's on page 118. Page 119 talks about what happens um, when there needs to be a review or redetermination process that tells us to go to chapter 16. We're not there yet. We will get there, but not yet. So um, hang on to your hats. It'll be exciting. We'll get there. Um, but we're going to talk about recovery audit contractors, uh, RACs. And those are in here. They look at, they, they're looking to find incorrect payments. And when they find those, um, they get a portion of the proceeds of what they find. So they are very aggressive and very eager to um, find things that can be redetermined, shall we say. So pages 120 and 121 give sample remittance advices, RAs, that you can take a look at. And that's really going to finish off Chapter 6. Um, there's key points there. Make sure you take a look at those. There's student assignments that you can do um, and check and make sure that that's what needs to happen. So since this video is 21 minutes already, I'm going to end it now and I will start back up with um, Chapter 7. So hang in there.